I read it. Hi, Sandy. Hey, how are you? I'm <laughs> taking it minute by minute. <laughs> I know. How about you? <laughs> oh, boy, this, this has been a challenge. Huh? Oh, my God. I know my, all my teacher friends and relatives are like, they're working harder than they've ever worked before in their lives. Yeah, you just online all day, you know? And yeah. 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 I'm like that, too. Crazy. Well, uh, hopefully it's temporary and we'll get over it. Yeah. <laughs> you notice I have Okay, great. I am going to call this Wednesday, April 8th, 2020 special meeting of the Scarborough Town Council to order. Uh, the first order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Okay, great. Uh, item number three is roll call. Tody, would you like to take roll call? Uh, Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Gleistein? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. 
Councilor Johnson? Here. Councilor Hamill? Here. Chairman Johnson? Here. And I don't believe uh, Councilor Cloutier is present. He is not, and I will okay. I'll attempt to reach him over phone. Thank you. Uh, so uh, before we begin, I just a quick rundown of the structure of the meeting. The meeting is going to be a little bit uh, looser than what is on our current agenda. So I just, for everybody that's watching at home and participating with us, I just wanted to give a quick rundown of the structure of the meeting. Uh, before item number four, we're gonna have the town attorney, Phil uh, Saucier, come and speak to us for a question and answer session um, with these uncertain times. And um, as we head into budget season, I think all of us would appreciate some um, Q and A time with an attorney to get a few facts straight and to help us make an informed decisions as we go along. Um, after the Q and A with the town attorney, we will have the joint presentation of the budget by both um, Tom Hall and Sandy Prince. Uh, we will then do a brief Q and A with uh, those two gentlemen for counselors. And then after that, I will open it up to public comment. And after that, we then we'll move on to item number five, which are counselor comments. Uh, if you are an attendee watching us here, if you would like to make a public comment, all you have to simply do is press the raise hand button down below. If you're watching us on Zoom, <coughs> if you press your raise hand button, I will call on you. Um, once I do call on you, you do have to quickly unmute yourself. When you come into the comment section, you will be by default put on mute. So just unmute for your comments. Um, and there will be no video, so it will just be your voice in real time. Uh, and again, that is the, and if anybody has any questions, just uh, raise your hand and I'll hope to clarify that. Um, so with that being said, uh, Tom, is Phil with us right now? It doesn't appear so. I just texted him. Hopefully okay. he joins momentarily. Okay. I reached out to the counselor clue to you too. No response. Do you want to take a, do we want to take a three minute recess so we're not waiting for it, Phil? Is that okay? Yeah, I think it'd be fine. I'll call. Okay. So I'll take a, let's call it a five minute recess. We'll take a five minute recess and hope we, hopefully we can track down Phil. So okay. we'll be right back.
Okay, great. So I'm going to call this meeting back to order. Um, just as to recap for those that just joined us here, and also I think we picked up a few extra attendees in the audience. Uh, we are going to, before we get to item number four, uh, as a council, we have requested a quick Q&A session with the town attorney, Phil Saucier. Um, and I don't know if Phil's going to have some opening remarks, Phil, or would you, would you like us to jump right into some Q&A? Uh, up to you. I, I am aware of some of the questions the council's had, and I think I responded to a few. If you, if it's helpful, I could just briefly summarize where I think we are, and then yeah, that that would be great. And then then I'll okay. do Q and A afterwards. Yep. <clears throat> Sounds good. So uh, um, a number of the questions that I got and I I, I emailed were about the effect um, on whether or not if if the council either does not act within sixty days, essentially, what's what's the effect of that on the budget? You you have a charter provision, in section five hundred three of your charter that states that um, the town council shall review the budget and adopt it with or without change no later than 60 days from the date of its submission to the town council. In the event that the town council does not adopt the budget within 60 days, the budget as presented by the town manager and the board of education shall automatically become the budget for the fiscal year, whereas otherwise provided by state law. So you have an opportunity once it's, once it's been submitted uh, to you officially, uh, you have 60 days, and if and if you don't uh, approve it within that time period, it's deemed the budget. That's so. That's the basic premise we start with under your charter. It's it's a specific to uh, Scarborough. I see a question. Is it okay to take questions now? If that's the chair, as people come in, or oh, Phil, why don't you finish, and then we'll then I'll take questions. Okay. Um, so it's basic premise. Um, uh, there's obviously a sub component subcomponent of that which is the school budget the school budget requires a uh, budget validation referendum to approve that so after you approve the budget at your budget meeting it goes to the voters and then the voters approve it or not <clears throat> as, as, is, as is the case um, the state law on the budget approval school budget approval deals with the situation on when it's not approved or when it's not uh, uh, approved and validated by July 1st so there's an outer limit and what that law says, that's in Title 20A, Section 1487, for those who are, who are following on the statutes, says that if, they, if a budget is not approved, a school budget is not approved and validated before July 1st, um, then, uh, then the budget that was approved by the budget meeting and submitted to the voters is the budget, is considered the budget for operational reasons. In other words, the school board can continue to use that until it's actually approved by the voters. So to take a step back again, if you approve the budget, it goes to the voters, but the voters don't get a chance to vote on it or they, or they reject it, um, then the budget that was presented that you approved becomes the budget, and to, uh, the school budget, until the voters approve it. That's, that's the basic premise. So in other words, the idea behind it is the town council would have had an opportunity to look at that budget and would have okayed that budget. Um, before it went to the voters, it still needs that ultimate step of, uh, eventually, but there has to be a sort of operational guideline for the school department to continue to operate. And just as final thing, the term of art um, in a lot of these statutes, and probably you've seen this, uses the term budget meeting. You have a municipal school department, and so what that means is really the town council voting on the budget. In RSUs or SADs um, or other types of schools, it, it means an actual budget meeting is what's called called by the regional school board. But in your case, it means the town council voting to approve the budget that was submitted to you by the town manager consolidated with the school budget. So that's the general overview. And if there's any questions, happy to take them at this time. Councilor Clucci? Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, that was very helpful, actually. And Thank I you. I think uh, one thing that people might be missing is this meeting doesn't necessarily mean that he's uh, that the budget is being submitted to the council, right? That's, and I, I guess I'd, I'd like Tom to kind of respond to that. It, it, are you viewing this as your submission, or are you going to actually send us a, a, a budget, you know, a traditional submission? I guess something that has the budget book and then your your memo on top of it that says, "Here's the budget, guys." <clears throat> Well, actually, by now, you, you all should have received by email a copy, a digital copy of the budget, or if not, within the next several minutes. Uh, simultaneously, that will be made available on our website, and we have actually printed copies as well that we can distribute. We've got some logistical challenges to make that happen, but we can do that in, over the next several days. And so, uh, historically, uh, on the, at the meeting where the budget is presented, 
a physical handoff and that's the first time the council sees the budget document and so we really modeled uh this year exactly like we've done every pr previous year that you you have it in your hand uh, and it's yours so we should have it soon anyway yeah it, it should be in your inbox any second literally okay Councilor glycine uh, yes, so um, um, I'm kind of familiar with, you know, how they do the, um, like you said, it was the term budget meeting is used a lot because of the RSUs and the SADs, and I'm familiar with that process. Um, and so the, uh, is it possible to, to, uh, to join based on what Count Councilor Clucci said to um, make a decision or interpret our charter for uh, since you did mention a vote at the budget meeting as that the 60 day clock would start at first read and that this would be a presentation and not start the 60 day clock running and that the 60 day clock would actually start when we vote for the budget uh, to, to move it to second read. Can we, uh, could we interpret our charter that way, especially since uh, we don't, we, it is a different year. We don't have the budget book. Um, if there was an email that came out, I'm sorry, I missed it. I was trying to check email today, uh, but it is uh, a little stressful to feel whether or not this is a true submission and the 60 day clock starts. I'm very happy to see a presentation tonight, uh, but I am extremely concerned uh, about starting the 60 day clock. So it's a good question that, um... You know, your charter doesn't provide a lot of guidance. It just uses the word submitted or submission. Um, you could, you know, if there was a desire of the council that uh, to decide that this is more of a, uh, I guess you'd call it sort of an informational presentation and not a official submission, I think you could decide to do that. I don't think you would, I, I think it's harder to say you're doing that if you're going to accept it for first read, quite frankly, because the first reading suggests you, are, you have accepted something um, mm -hmm. and you've actually taken official notice of it. So, um, so no, I, I don't think that would be the way to do it. I think if, if you've decided that this is not a submission, that would be clear the town manager could make that clear um, that, this is, that this is an initial discussion, if you will, and the council could move in that direction as long as everyone is on the same page on that. But it's not clear in the charter, so there's always a bit of a risk, but I think it's a fairly low risk because um, uh, if you don't accept it as first read, essentially. And Phil, just to follow up on uh, Councilor Glycine's question, would, yeah. there, would you suggest that we take some sort of vote on that this evening if we wanted to go that route? Or do you think it's just, it's pretty defensible, so so essentially we can go to first reading and assume that's our the submission date? You could decide, for example, if that's the direction you want to go, that, that um, at this point, just at this point, it was a presentation, but um, that you expect that it'll be submitted at the next meeting, for example, mm -hmm. um, and make so it, I think it'd be helpful if that was clear that the that you were the submission would be at a later date. And that was, you know, um, uh, clear in the record. I see Tom's got a question too. Just to, if I could, Councilor Gleistein, if your question has to do with the fact that the uh, ballot, the, the uh, June primary may be pushed back to July. At this point, it's my understanding that that's not official, but perhaps likely. My only cautionary note to the council would be further delay of the official submission to start the budget process uh, is constrained by the fact that, um, <clears throat> that the validation vote. Now, we could have a validation vote on a date other than the June primary, but we tend to do that for efficiency and turnout reasons, and I think it makes sense to align the validation vote with that primary date as, as much as we can. Good. I don't think that this uh, slips that. I mean, we still have, we already have a meeting scheduled for next week. Um, so, uh, and I'm, I'm not overly concerned about the referendum now and these unusual circumstances, um, you know, whether or not it gets delayed, whether or not we even have to have a special one, how it's going to run. There's just so many unknowns right now. Um, I, I have, uh, you know, heard a lot of concern um, that, you know, the longer that we can, uh, even an extra week to get a little more information um, before we start the clock would be a help. So that's more my concern is the 60 day timer, um, not so much when the referendum will happen, but good, good points. 
So question, is there a possibility if the governor were to um, extend the primary date to July that there'd be some mechanism that would supersede our charter and give us more time or is that completely independent of each other and that's not worth it? Uh, at this point, they're completely independent of each other. There have, you know, the emergency legislation did, and I put that in my initial email, have some language about superseding charters, but it was specific to public health concerns related to people being be able to physically meet and things like that. So there's always a chance that there could be a, a future uh, emergency legislation or some sort of executive order that could do something like that. But at this point, there's not. So even if the elections push out, your 60 day clock is still there under your charter, if you will. Yeah. Councillor Hayes? Yeah, yeah. J just a new one, I'll make sure I understand it. So if, if I track with what you were saying, if irregardless of whether this is considered the presentation or next week, that 60 day clock, if the town council doesn't take any action for whatever reason, um, you know, what, I, what I'm concerned about, I'm sorry. Uh, when I'm concerned about does, you know, with the virus going around, what if some of us get sick? What if it postpones it? But if I heard you right, if we don't take any action at 60 days, whatever we consider the presentation date, both the submitted budget by the superintendent and town manager become the budget that become effective seven one. If, if the town council does approve the school budget number, and it happens to go to a referendum and doesn't pass, that becomes the controlling budget that was not passed at referendum. Is, is, is that correct? That that was the nuance that you presented? That's right. It becomes the, the budget for op, what they use the term operational reasons because there's still opportunities for the voters to continue to pass it. And you may, you know, that has happened obviously in some communities where it goes back a couple different times but at a certain point you need a budget by July 1st for operational reasons. So it's used for that. And eventually it may even become the budget for tax commitment purposes. So if it gets out to the tax commitment date, the statute deals with that, there has to be a date that you actually commit taxes. Um, so I would agree with your nuance with that additional slight nuance. Yeah, and that to me is, you know, that at least that's the piece for me that, that gives me a little bit of concern that, that you know, I don't know when we, and I don't know if this is a question for the town manager, when we pass the budget, if one of us is sick and not able to be there, is it a super majority? Is it a simple majority? Is it based on the, what's, what's a quorum for purposes of passing or making a budget action if, if the two of us were sick and not available? I, I believe, Tony, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the charter requires a vote of five for the budget be five affirmative votes or just five people present? Five affirmative votes. Cody? She's muted. She's yes. Under. Yes, that's correct. So that, so that becomes my concern. If three of us got sick, then we wouldn't be able to take action on the budgets, right? I, that's certainly a possibility. Uh, not sure how to respond. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure either. I, I, um, I, what I was pausing on, and I'm, I've got a screen over here, so if you see me looking over there, I've got my other computer screen. I had up the emergency legislation um, that I that I sort of mentioned before. I still don't think that would help us. That's the that's the statute that says that the prior year's budget continues if you weren't able to hold your budget meeting due to public health concerns arising from COVID-19. There may be a little bit, I haven't thought about it in terms of if like individual members were sick um, and whether this provision would apply even though we're meeting remotely. Um, so I'll be honest with you, I may have to think about that one a little bit more, but my, my our, I said sort of mostly collective interpretation of that provision is really dealing with when people can't physically meet in the same room, so. I, I think, Peter, you're right that it, uh, um, the 60 day clock would still continue in that, in your hypothetical. And, Councilor Katarina? In that, in that hypothetical, um, though. Whoops, someone oh. needs to mute there. <laughs> uh, my question is. Let, I'm sorry, Katarina, I'm sorry. I didn't know Peter. I'll let Peter do his follow up. I'm sorry. I didn't realize. Peter, I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
Peter, did you want to follow up? I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, it, but in that hypothetical that I just did, if three of us got sick and the 60 day clock expired before the town council could take action, the presented budgets would be the operational budgets until the time that we either could fill those seats or people are healthy and well. Right. Thank you. Can I ask one follow up to that, Phil? Does that? Well, yeah, go ahead. go ahead. I'm sorry. Does that, since we're going on the hypothetical of three of us getting sick, would that be after first reading? If we, if would the first reading budget number stand if it was adjusted at first reading? No, it's it's it. You'd have to actually approve it. That's it's why I read your charter. Yeah, okay. right. You have to yep. you have to vote to you have to vote to approve within six days. Yeah, right. Perfect. Otherwise, it's deemed approved. Yeah, makes sense. Councilor Katarina. Um. Yeah. This is for Phil. Uh, Phil is. Given that we have exigent circumstances, um, you know, with COVID-19 that no one could have predicted when they wrote right. the charter or anything else, is there anything within our charter that gives the town council the right or the authority to supersede the charter in exigent circumstances, i.e. to set a different date uh, to say for this, this one instance only? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, on a, at the top of my head, um, there are certain emergency powers that the town manager can have in you can declare emergency. Um, I, you know, I, we, I've talked about that a little bit. I've dealt with a lot of towns that have been dealing with their emergency management. I, I'm not, I don't know the answer to your question, Jean Marie. I'll have to think about that. The, the, there's, there's a lot of ambiguity around those emergency orders. Right. That's the only, so anyways, that's the only place I can think of where there yep. even is the possibility is if there's a declaration of emergency. But yeah. I'm not even sure that the town manager could do that. Um, that seems maybe going a step too far. And then, uh, and then just to follow up, uh, I know the legislature passes laws all the time that they then yeah. don't follow and they're not required to follow. What's <laughs> what's <laughs> what's what's the punishment if the council didn't follow the charter? What what are the potential downsides to that? So it could be subject to challenge, you know, uh, by someone who would. Uh, could qualify as a party in interest in some way. Okay. Um, you know, I can't, uh, I wouldn't be able to handicap that at this moment, but someone could challenge the decision of the council or lack of a decision of the council for that matter mm -hmm. um, and get some sort of declaratory judgment from a court um, that you either acted appropriately or not. And to the extent there are budgetary, you know, rationales, there could be obviously financial walkbacks or uh, that would be associated with that. Um, mm -hmm. There's also a general, um, and just, just to have to let you know, it rarely occurs, but there's a lot, um, a statute in Maine that um, counselors and boards of selectmen can be held liable for, for actions that are not legal. Right. So like if you illegally do something or illegally spend money and a court then later finds that you did illegally spend money, you could in theory be personally liable to pay back into the FISC. Okay. So that's that's always a risk. Yeah, I just wanted to bring that up because I know yeah. I've had other people say, well, can't you guys just vote to whatever? So I just wanted to make sure right. we address that. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Any, any more questions for Phil? None? Oh, Councillor Hayes? Yeah, just on that, on that last comment, I mean, kind of got caught my attention about personal <laughs> life. Thought it might. Right. Um, Tom, do we, this is a question for the town manager. Tom, do we, is there protection for us in that case or are we actually personally liable? Uh, you can be if you're through malfeasance or some sort of uh, uh, action by full knowledge. And I'm not being articulate here, but yes, there are potential exposures to elected officials depending on, uh, on your actions of malfeasance or, or otherwise. And that's, you know, Phil, you can certainly speak to that better than I can. Well, that's right. And um, and again, I, I also don't want to speak without understanding fully any kind of insurance coverage that you specifically have. But generally, insurance cover coverage is for um, actions that, you know, are not um, like malfeasance, as the word Tom used. I'm not sure what the policy is, but you said, you know, when it's not done with malice, uh, that, you know, it's that you're acting uh, within an area that you think that you're able to, um, that kind of thing, but not if you know what you're doing is wrong, that's just often excluded from, from coverage. And again, I'm speaking without looking at your particular policy. Uh, Peter, it seems to me though, the scenario you raise, uh, you know, though there may be some 
limited outside risk that it's a technical violation of the charter that you're not able right. as a council to act because of illness or absence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, th that's a, a world different than some act of malfeasance. That's, it's a different right. cause. There's right. still the technical violation of the charter, but uh, for reasons that are very well explained and hopefully understood. Right. So that's right. Lo low risk. It's probably, maybe it's uh, uh, implicit, but I think it's important to, to point out, I think the, the voters were quite wise in drafting the charter in many respects, but in this respect, there are some very key checks and balances built into the budget process, um, starting with requiring your professional staff to start the conversation with a budget submission, to start it where we think in our professional opinion uh, we need to be, but then it's turned over to the council and it's up to you uh, to, to do what you will. Uh, ours is really a starting point. I, I encourage you to look at it that way. Um, but it also guards against uh, a council filibustering or stonewalling a budget and just refusing to act. The fact is we have an operation, a business that needs to, be, needs to run and we need to support those operational expenses. And so, you know, Considering the awards literally, it's it's a scary proposition that the budget I submit and the Board of Education submits becomes the budget. I think it's there for a reason. It's to motivate the council to do its business. And uh, I appreciate this year it causes us some all some angst and uncertainty during this this period. So I'm going to ask you a question. I know the answer to, but I just it's something that just come is coming up a lot in conversations. The failure to act is simply us us either flat out rejecting the budget or or failure to meet where in reality we would pass an amended budget so when we right. talk about failure to act if we don't like the budget that is our sole authority to adjust the budget accordingly and act on that adjusted budget that's exactly right yeah okay i just and the just, charter uses the word change the budget um so you can use yeah but i agree so, with you and so in theory of course we would not do this but we could adjust that budget to $10 and, and pass it on to the voters. That's right. Yeah. Councilor Hamill. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, in any case, there have been a lot of questions about time frames. Uh, it sounds like there you know, clearly are incentives for us, according to the charter, to finish within a certain time, a 60 day clock. Everyone's concerned about that. Uh, and it's, I think you've answered very well, Phil. Thank you for what happens if we, you know, don't finish by, by that time and then which budget goes into effect, but it does seem to me in these times that if we're, you know, uh, if there's any opportunity to, to buy more time, if you will, uh, it doesn't seem unreasonable to me to, to uh, not treat this evening as, uh, you know, as uh, the time for the clock to start, but rather to treat the first reading at, as that date, number one, and number two, I mean, I understand that I think the as I understand, the board of ed isn't really even approved of you know this budget we're going to see tonight either. So, and we'll be seeing. Tom's just came over the transom, so it does seem to me whatever time we can can gain, however small on the front end, might be useful. So, not a question, kind of more of a statement, really. So, Phil, the, Phil, the action, the non-action on number four says that this is a presentation. It doesn't say that this is a submission of the budget. Is that enough to proceed and start our clock in a week? Yeah, and I assume there's not going to be any vote necessarily tonight. It's a it's a simple presentation. You know what I would do just to make it clear to people and for the record is when you do uh, next week, you as part of a motion you could accept the submission. You could use that terminology. You accept the submission of the budget and move for the first reading or some something like that. So then at least it's in the record that that's the submission date. Great. Are there any other questions? Councillor uh, Hayes? Yeah, so so are we, is, is that what we're doing? Is that proposal through the chair that we're gonna start the clock on the first read? Doesn't seem like there's any harm in it, so. Uh, I, I, it's important, there's a nuance here. I, I don't think it's the first read, as Phil said earlier, that, that triggers it. I think it's the formal submission. Presentation. And I think the submission. Submission. The nuance tonight is that this could be a, uh, a presentation only, uh, but it does not uh, serve as the formal submission. And my only concern would be if that delay is 
is extended. I think that presents some challenges on the back end of this process, but a, a week is certainly not going to upset the process. Great. Uh, okay. So Peter, I mean, I'm specifically, it, it sounds to me like we have our answer. So it, uh, if I'm understanding Phil right, there's no action necessarily on our end, so. That's right, and just make it clear next week. Yep, okay, great. Are there any other questions for Phil? Phil, thank you, this was incredibly helpful. I think I, I see a lot of head nodding, which is good. So thank you very much, sir, we appreciate it. Thank you very much, okay. yep, yeah, talk to you thank soon. You. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Phil. Okay, we are now going to uh, move on to item number four, which is a non-action item. It's the joint presentation of the proposed FY 2021 municipal and school budgets. And if everybody will just bear with me, I need to get this up. So I will be controlling the, uh, to Sandy and Tom, I'll be controlling the actual presentation. So by all means, feel free to boss me around if I need to, if I'm going too fast or too slow. Can a couple people give me the thumbs up? Can we see that? I just can't see it anymore, so, okay. Yes. Perfect, so uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, gentlemen. Yeah, Sandy, let me start if I could. Uh, before we get into the presentation, and this is a, a, a joint presentation, it's very high level. Uh, as I said, uh, the, the budget is now available on our website, so folks can go and look at the, uh, the detail as they wish. Uh, members of council, you, you have, by now, I hope, received an email. So I'd like to make a couple of introductory comments first. Can you go back, Paul? Yep, sorry, technical error. Yep. So certainly in the best of times, preparing a budget, which is really predicting the future, uh, is challenging. And uh, in, in normal times, I'll say, we have the luxury of looking back at history and drawing from experience. Uh, and uh, more times than not, do a pretty good job of estimating what that 12 months of experience is likely to look like. Uh, this year, you know, adds a level of challenge that I certainly have never seen in my professional life and hope I never do again. Uh, but at best, a budget is an estimate of experience. And so keep that in mind. Given the events of the last three weeks um, and the uncertainty that it brings and, and really the anxiety that I think we all feel professionally and personally, uh, it's caused me to work hard over the last three weeks to rework my budget request. And just so you appreciate, uh, in that time, I've reduced the budget request from my department heads by over $1.6 million uh, in recognition that we're in a different place. And we've hit the, the sorts of areas that are not comfortable territory to, to cover, at least this early in the budget, but I thought it was necessary to start this conversation at a different place. So for instance, we have no uh, COLA increases for our non-union staff which is not gonna be uh, go over well, but I, I think appropriate given the times. We've eliminated essentially all discretionary spending in areas like training, travel, supplies, equipment. Uh, we're holding open vacant positions and I've essentially decimated our capital budget at this point. And uh, there's, an, there's a number of important projects that come forward. I think it's important for the council and the community to, to have an open conversation around those. In addition, uh, back in November, we put a budget curtailment in that certainly remains in place. We've had a hiring freeze and we've hired, we've furloughed all part-time employees. So in my view, we've taken really, I'll call evasive action to handle, uh, to, to deal with our current situation and the current budget and have tried to start the conversation for next year's budget, recognizing that, that uncertainty. So the next level of discussion uh, really needs to involve others, in the, the whole community, members of the council, your finance committee. Uh, I don't have all the answers. Uh, I can, and I remain uh, ready to support you and to be part of these conversations, but we need many voices. These next uh, discussions will be very difficult, I assure you. Uh, it means layoffs on the town side. I, I can say that uh, without, without question at this point, that's the next step for us. So please, Keep in mind, this is a starting point for the conversation, and we look forward to, um, to getting everyone involved and have some input. Sandy, do you have any comments you wanna make before we jump into it?
I think he's on mute. Sandy? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I'm fine. I'll just go through the slides when I'm ready, and uh, I think we'll tell the story. Okay, Paul, let's go. So this is the uh, overall budget. Uh, this is showing the different components, municipal, education, county, and capital. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see the, uh, the right-hand column is arguably the most important. It shows the percentages, and in my view, it's covered up by all of your faces, but I'll walk down through it. On the middle, municipal side, and this is for net uh, change to the budget, we're showing a 2.1% increase. Education is uh, starting with a 5.2% net increase. The county budget is up 7.8%. And capital, you can disregard that. That number is um, a literal calculation. It's, it's not very meaningful in this context. Overall, uh, the net change, and that is the money to be raised by property taxes uh, as a starting point is 5.8%. Uh, to remind members of the council and, and board of education, there have been conversations starting last fall, continuing through the winter and early spring around first reading targets. And those targets were for the town to start uh, below 4% net and the school 6% net. So, you know, it comes as little solace, but we've certainly met those requirements. Uh, I think we appreciate that those goals um, uh, may not be relevant any further, but I, I think it's just important to point that out that that was our target and uh, we've certainly met that um, at this point. So the next, uh, Paul. What that all means uh, in the bottom line, the top uh, uh, line in this chart is again, that net budget number showing the 5.8%. Uh, the middle is the valuation estimate. This is something we worked very hard on this, this year. Uh, the council has had a policy for predicting uh, future value increases. And because of the revaluation, uh, that really doesn't apply right now. And so we've, we've really done a thoughtful analysis and I'm uh, interested to have a much more deeper conversation around uh, what that analysis uh, entailed. Uh, but we're showing uh, a very modest increase of $10 million in total valuation change. And that takes into account um, the $43 million in abatements that have been granted over the course of this year, the 25 million that will be coming off for the homestead exemption and we've also reduced about $10 million in expected personal property um, taxes, uh, tax value. So uh, this is something that is not a surprise. Uh, and frankly, it came in better than I had originally pro uh, projected. And I'm again, interested in having a deeper conversation with uh, all of you about those details. The end result between the, uh, the additional money to be raised by uh, property taxes and the expected value uh, at this point is projecting a mill rate increase uh, about 5.5%, uh, give or take. And we have a much tighter range that we're using this year based on uh, the methodology that we used for the valuation. Next call. So for the, for the town side, there are primary drivers in the, in the budget and it, it's worth just uh, talking about those quickly. Uh, one of them is increased debt service uh, in part, in large part due to uh, the public safety building, we have nearly borrowed all the money. There's a, a small remainder uh, in this next bond issue, but we, we're now essentially seeing the full impact of, uh, of the public safety building and all the other uh, annual borrowing as well. Next, we have contractual obligations we must honor uh, for our unions. Um, so those are COLAs and, and, and step increases. Uh, I don't have control over those uh, unilaterally and that has to be collectively bargained. Our workers' comp has gone up um, a remarkable $165,000. We've had some unfortunate uh, occurrences uh, with medical indemnity costs that have driven up our experience modification. And we're working very hard to, to try to get those back in line. Uh, the council may recall last year, there were a number of positions, uh, four in the fire department and one in the police department that whose start date was delayed. And so this year we're seeing the full cost of some of those new staff. Again, not expected, uh, but not a, you know, a big, there was a, there's a price tag associated there. On the town side, uh, we have estimated a 10% increase in health insurance. I know our colleagues in the school just got very good news 
um, and we hope to enjoy good news, but we think it's important to continue estimating um, what our health trust is, it has advised us. Uh, that's a big number in itself, and, and we'll be able to improve that as we get uh, um, further advice from our health insurance coverage. And then lastly, uh, again, should come as no surprise, but uh, with a, a new public safety building, uh, about twice the size of the existing building, there are additional costs uh, just to maintain a building of that size and keep it clean and heated and so on and so forth. And so uh, that's a quick overview of kind of the big uh, drivers on the town side at this point. Uh, Sandy, do you want to go into the school drivers? Yes, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, so the school drivers are salaries and benefits. As you know, we have collective bargaining agreements, and um, that's pretty much almost 80% of our budget actually comes down to 79.5%. So we're a pretty labor intensive type of organization. Uh, another driver is our increasing enrollment, particularly at the K2. Uh, and I think that's no surprise to anybody, but all three elementary schools will need to have additional teachers for next year. And I'll talk more about that on another slide. Um, the social, emotional, and behavior needs uh, and special ed students continues to grow. And the numbers are there as enrollment increases. We see several kids who need special services. And, and that's a state and federal law to provide those services. Age in overcrowded facilities, K through two and our middle school. And then um, the teaching and learning, that, that's really important to us and the curriculum and assessment updates uh, as part of the budget. So those are the big drivers. And the new investment proposals, we have the essential student services. And I'm just gonna kind of highlight some of those areas. We have two behavior specialists that K through two we would like to invest in. We have six ed techs to support students and to work with staff in the special ed department. And again, that's required by law. The numbers uh, dictate how many staff can work with a certain amount of students. Um, in addition to that, our curriculum, um, our CDS uh, kindergarten counts are coming in slowly and we are projecting what our kindergarten classes will be through uh, CDS, which is an organization that helps us get those numbers. And we'll be including a uh, one speech therapist position that is required by, again, federal law, state law. You can only have so many students work with a speech therapist on their caseload. Um, in addition to that, K through two, we are projecting to have four classroom teachers, which will really impact those schools. I know it's no surprise to people that those schools are very overcrowded. Two of those classrooms will go to eight corners. One will go to Blue Point and one teaching position go to Pleasant Hill. And then the curriculum and program updates. Uh, we have some math curriculum that we want to update. We have the middle school world language program that we had the goal to align that with the high school world language program. And we're most proud of the unified sports programs at the middle school and high school. It's about all students and that's really what we're shooting for. Next slide. So this just uh, kind of brings it back around. Again, the bottom line is we're looking at a, uh, uh, an additional 5.8% uh, in terms of uh, money to be raised at commitment through property tax, uh, producing uh, about a 5.5% increase on tax rate. Next. So there are still uh, a number of items in motion. Uh, as I said earlier, final cost insurance, uh, health insurance costs for the town. Uh, Sandy, you want to take the next couple? Sure. So the estimated valuation is uh, something in motion. And uh, obviously the collective bargaining is, we have two contracts that are up this year and uh, that's still a work in progress. And then uh, special ed, Department, again, we try to look at the numbers that we have, but um, it seems like each year the numbers continue to grow. 
and we have more incoming to involving kiddos that need special ed services. Student enrollment, again, I mentioned that earlier, and uh, that's a key factor of our budget. It's a, a challenge, but it's an opportunity as people are coming to the Scarborough community, and I think they're proud of the town and the school. And then other insurance costs, uh, Anthem did come in, and we're, we're fortunate to see it come in at 1.7% increase. That is pretty good compared to some other past years. The property, um, property and workman's comp, we're still waiting to get uh, figures on that, and, uh, but that should be coming our way any time soon. So how uh, folks in the community can stay engaged? Uh, uh, we do have the budget portal on the website, and that is your kind of one-stop shopping, if you will. Uh, again, the, the budget uh, is in all its full details should be available as I speak. Uh, all proceedings with the finance committee, uh, I, I believe for both the town, the school, and any joint meetings will be done through the Zoom platform. Uh, we'll also be uh, live streaming those on YouTube as we are this meeting. And uh, I, I believe we'll be live streaming as well on channel uh, 1302 uh, through Spectrum. So here's just a look forward. Uh, this kind of goes back to the conversation we started with. Uh, it appears as though, I'm not sure, uh, this slide looks strange to me. I beg your pardon. Uh, let's let's look at the first reading Wednesday the 15th and it looks like we'll also accomplish the formal budget submission that evening and then there's a, a the, I don't need to go through all these dates um, I, I did include um, a hopeful piece here by saying to be determined some of the future meetings in May uh, it, it is possible we'll continue to do this in the virtual environment but to the extent that we can get back together as a group face to face uh, we'll certainly do that when it's available to all of us. Uh, we'll, we'll figure that out as we go. Um, it seems like this virtual environment uh, is, is, is viable. Uh, otherwise, I don't think we would even try to do this. Uh, and it, it does also occur to me that it, it may even invite more public participation in the process, which is something we have really worked hard to figure out how to do uh, without much success historically. So um, this approach uh, may actually improve that. Uh, the final piece, just cautionary to all of us, is that uh, the ending date of this whole process is the school budget validation vote. Technically and officially, it's still scheduled uh, for June 9, uh, though the governor has uh, floated the idea of pushing that to July 14th. Uh, I'm not aware that that's formalized yet, but I, I can't imagine she would suggest that if there wasn't some uh, truth in that. Um, if that becomes the case, I think that provides further opportunity for the council to maybe look at modifying some of the latter dates and more importantly, your second reading date uh, and give yourself some extra time. So uh, I think between grabbing the week on the front end and maybe two or three weeks on the back end, um, uh, you know, I think that could be helpful hopefully with the council and the public to uh, come up to speed on the budget to provide good input and to get to a different place. So that's our presentation for this evening. Uh, I, I truly do see this as a starting point for the discussion. Um, I think I can speak for Sandy that we fully acknowledge that, uh, that more, perhaps much more needs to be done in this, uh, but it's important that we widen the conversation to include uh, certainly members of the council and the community in these conversations and look forward to that in the coming weeks. With that, I think we're available for questions. We'll do our best to field those. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Councilor Gleisky. Um, just a, a quick question to start. The 7.8% county, is that set or are they still working on their budget as well? And that's an estimate. No, that's set. They're on the calendar year. So that is an approved budget. That's a real number. That's a big number. <laughs> it is. And uh, of course, their expenses are going up. But I think the bigger uh, factor at play there is the way that that those uh, costs are apportioned are based on percentage of assessed value in the county. And as we continue to perform and in many respects outperform others in our county, our share by percentage goes up. So it's really a, a, a double barrel effect on us. Could I just see if I understand that just to clarify a little bit. Um, 
that assessed value is not based on our reval that the county themselves provides an assessed value based on a number of factors. So it's not necessarily our reval that would drive our increased percentage to the county, but they, they calculate their own value. Is that correct? No, I believe they use the uh, official state equalized value for purposes of calculating the apportionment. Right. Yes. Are there any more questions for Tom or Sandy on the overview? Councillor Hayes? You're on mute, Councillor Hayes. Yep, just a quick question for the town manager. Tom, in your numbers, the CEA monies are gonna be due to the downs is netted in your numbers someplace and we'll see that in the budget detail. Yes, uh, it's, it's uh, best seen, and frankly, it's only seen on the tax rate computation page. Um, okay. And uh, that's one of the areas that we really scrutinized heavily as part of our analysis, looking at valuation for next year. So uh, more so than years past, um, I have a much higher degree of confidence that we're actually carrying a valid number there. Uh, this time of the year, we're often flying blind in that regard. We also have some good news. Uh, one of our uh, CEAs expired this year. That's for the Enterprise Business Park. And the other one for New England Expedition, we're actually, uh, we will be meeting our annual limit. And so there's some money flowing back to us for the first time in that one. Uh, so there's some good news in, in, in some regards there. But I, to answer your question, I believe we have an adequate budget estimate for that, that expense. And it's netted out. <clears throat> it's netted out of that 5.5 total tax request. You're saying, right? I mean, it's it's included. Yeah, it is. Yeah, we consider it an expense because we we reimburse that. So we see it in the valuation number because it's true value, but we have an expense vis-a-vis -vis the credit enhancement agreements. And uh, I'm extremely confident in in the number we're carrying there. Thank you. Tom, can you speak to if you made any adjustments to your typical um, excise tax projections due to the recent environment? At this point, I've kept it flat. And I think that's a point that I uh, am concerned and cautious about. And I want to, I don't have a, I don't have the answer to it necessarily. So I, I that's something I want to broaden the conversation, get all of your input, frankly. Uh, I can say, at least anecdotally, uh, we don't have any proof of this, but during the last three weeks, uh, no new car registrations have, have happened. So we don't have any good data to track in terms of the more recent experience. Anecdotally, I'm hearing that car sales are going quite well with all sorts of incentives at the manufacturer and dealerships. And so at least in the near term, we may not see much of a, a, a blip. Uh, historically, excise tax has outperformed each and every year. And so as a starting point, I've not increased it certainly but I fully acknowledge that's an area we need to go back to and, and look at carefully. Are there any qu other questions for Tom or Sandy before we move to public comment? Councilor Hamill? Yeah, you know, I had a question uh, as they relate to the, you know, the overall percentage increases for the, you know, for the numbers we just saw. Uh, you know, I know we were following the guidelines that were established under uh, joint uh, finance committee resolutions that were adopted in some fashion by uh, the town and also the school. But I was kind of curious as to, uh, you know, uh, two things. One, I, I saw sort of like a 5.5% number there, Tom, in terms of, uh, you know, the overall increase. You know, was that expecting we would still be following the goal that was set of 3%, no greater than a 3% mill rate increase? Or is this just a first pass expecting it's gonna go you know, go down. And I'm just curious I, I, why we, we're not on that, that trajectory. Yeah, my understanding is that is the goal this year had a couple of components. One was for the first time a first reading target for net budget request for town and school. Uh, but at the end of the day, at adoption, that 3% tax rate, no more than 3% was the overall uh, target. But that was to be achieved after the review process and the council um, has its input into the process. So. For comparative purposes, you're, you're correct. We're starting at 5.57% increase in tax rate. And the target is to get to 3% or perhaps less. Uh, that's to be determined. And thank you. And I did have a follow-up for Sandy. I mean, I'd, Sandy, the numbers I saw were something like 5.79% net budget increase for the schools, but I saw 5.5% on my read. Is, is that a different, was that a, an adjustment from the numbers that were shared in the workshop or 
are they just restated? Those are the correct figures at this point in time. And um, it's, it's a process, as you know, Don, we, we're coming out of the gate at this point in time. And um, I think as we continue down the path, we'll make some refinements. It becomes the board's budget. It's almost like I'm turning it back over to the board. They're workshopping um, quite heavily this week and next week. So I, again, uh, we came in with what we felt as far as services and with the enrollment issues was a fair number, but I know um, it, it will change. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks yeah. very much. Sandy, are there any, um, and I ask this question not to be insensitive, but are there any savings be due on this fiscal budget due to the recent circumstances or do you not expect there to be any savings? We did put a soft freeze out, um, just told the administrators if there's something that you absolutely need to purchase then we would warrant that uh, go with that. But to hold the line as much as possible. Um, I, I know our facilities director has really turned the heat down on all the buildings. We're trying to make savings with uh, heat and electricity. So we're mindful of that. And uh, hopefully at the end, we'll come up with some savings. Thank you. Any other questions before I turn it over to the public? Okay, I'm now going to turn it over to public comments. So just bear with me. Um, if you would like to speak, there is a button down below that tells you to raise your hand. Uh, do not use the Q&A button. Please use the raise hand button. I will bring you into the meeting and you can speak uh, with audio only with no video. And I will pause, there are nobody raising their hand, but I will pause for a slight awkward amount of time just to make sure any technical challenges are overcome. Mr. Gates, I'm going to call on you. So when I do, you are going to just have to unmute your mic and please just state your full name and your address. Hi, my name is Marvin Gates and my address is 423 Black Point Road. And uh, thank you all very much for what you're doing. Uh, it's all above my pay grade. And I know the devil is in the details in these things. And I have no wisdom to provide uh, in details. My one observation listening to you is that with a net budget increase of 5.8%, and I suppose in my mind, the mill rate increase goes along with that of 5.5%. At the beginning of the conversation, I would love to hear what the lowest possible numbers uh, you might be thinking about kicking around in the backs of your heads might be. Uh, I, uh, and then finding a range between there in the details of what can be kept and what needs to be jettisoned perhaps uh, would be a very interesting, from my point of view, conversation to listen to. But I'd love to hear at the, at the beginning uh, what, what the worst case scenarios are and then possibly move back from that point towards the 5.8% net budget uh, change and also move from 5.8% back down to what the worst case scenario is. I hope that makes sense. Uh, and again, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Gates. And I'll pause just to see if there's anybody else that is raising their hand. Okay, I see none. So at this point, um, item number five is counselor comments. And I'm going to simply go around. My screen's probably not the same as everybody's. So I'm going to start here and go clockwise. Uh, so counselor Clucci. Um, well, well, thank you. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to take it all in. Uh, we, we had a few screenshots and we've got a 300 page budget book that arrived in our inbox while, you know, when we started the meeting. So it's going to take some time to really um, dive into it. I, I, to Mr. Gates comments, though, I, I, I would like to say that it, it's going to be a challenging year. We're going to um, try to balance a number of different conflicting priorities, right? We want to do right by our staff. We want to do right by our property taxpayers and um, 
and, and our administrators. So uh, we're going to need to make sure I, I was with what Tom did present, it, it seemed like there was some conservatism on the municipal side, which um, I was encouraged to see. So it, it may be that some of those assumptions can be relaxed as we learn more as we get closer. I, I'm not familiar enough on the school side to understand if there is that um, same level of conservatism. And I think as the school board uh, moves through their process, we'll understand that a little bit better. So I, I, you know, it's not an ideal situation for any of us to start um, the budget process remotely um, uh, without a lot of clarity, but we have to start somewhere. And in my mind, we're better off working with a budget that has some thought put into it than just trying to carry forward something from last year. So I'm, I'm committed to trying to work through the process and get to some place that uh, makes sense for the town. Thanks, sir. Councillor Katarina? Uh, yeah. Whoops. Am I muted? No, you're no. good. Okay, good. All right. I forget what I'm doing here. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, again, um, we've had our pre-submission of the budget. We haven't had a chance to look at it. I look forward to really, you know, perusing the numbers uh, and whatever. I also look forward to hearing from the school board as to um, what their numbers are and um, and how they can cut um, back somewhat on on where we're at. I I think that in this year, uh, given what's going on and what people are dealing with, uh, our taxpayers uh, in town. Um, the more we can hold on the budget, with, but but doing the least amount of damage, which is going to be really that's going to be walking a fine line, is what I I look to see, and I look forward to working with both the school board and with my fellow counselors um, to make that happen. Because um, this is it's this is a once in a lifetime situation that we're dealing with here, um, so it's going to be like threading a needle. Um, so. That's, those are my comments at this point. Thank you, Councilor Gleisey. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, I just, uh, I wanted to kind of lay out a little bit of history that maybe people uh, watching aren't aware of. Um, the, on March 23rd, we had our first virtual meeting and that was a meeting of the uh, joint finance committees between the Board of Education and the Town Council. And at that meeting, uh, we were a week, I think barely a week into the shutdown. Um, it was a very frenzied uh, week of getting, I'm sure for the staff, an incredibly frenzied week of getting remote meetings up, getting staff working from home. Um, just, I can't even list off all the things that they were doing. And uh, we voted in order to set the budget calendar, re kind of reset the budget calendar. Um, and I think at that time, we were all of the mindset, uh, I shouldn't say I'm not speaking for others, but I know I was of the mindset that, you know, let's hope this is short lived, let's keep as much normality as possible, Let, let's stick to what where we where we, uh, you know, as close to what we had planned to do as possible. I'm not necessarily from a, a budget standpoint, because we never uh, always agree on a budget, but from a standpoint of um, you know, the, the process. So uh, I just want to be clear, I voted affirmatively um, to for this uh, calendar that's been laid out um, and for this process. Um, and so um, the Board of Education, as well as the town manager um, did deliver based on uh, that vote, what was requested. So I want, I want that to be clear to folks but I'd also like to say, since that time, um, I personally have, uh, you know, changed my mind on what the process should look like. Um, I've strongly, over the last couple of days, um, encouraged and been in favor of a deliberation, a wide deliberation um, and uh, public conversation between the Board of Education and the Town Council that we come together as two bodies who are in this together who know that we are in extraordinary circumstances and to give folks some confidence that, um, you know, we know what they're up against. You know, we're already hearing from people and indeed there are people that are a part of our elected officials, you know, who have already been impacted from an economic standpoint, um, you know, with this shutdown. And uh, we don't know where the virus is going to go, but we 
we do know that the, the economic impact has already hit with uh, record numbers of people applying for unemployment in the state of Maine. Um, and uh, the so many applications that many people aren't even getting through, which I know the governor is trying to deal with. There have been some other communities uh, that have um, considered uh, direct aid to people at the local level. Um, I am hoping that we at least have a discussion about that because as a local government, we are in the best position to help people the quickest uh, should someone need you know, actual direct aid. The, the, the process to go through with the state and the process to go through with the federal government is going to be much, much slower. So uh, we have put things in place. Um, don't forget about scarboroughhelps.org. If you need help, you need to reach out so we can know. Um, but I hope we take this up as a body. I have a great hope that the two bodies will work together in this extraordinary time. Uh, I really think that that would be helpful. Um, I would like to also advocate that if the governor does uh, push the referendum date out, that we also push our start date out. And not to put this off or not to have business as usual or any of the other things that why we would push it off. But with each passing week, we're going to understand and we're going to know more. So um, I've had some people say to me, well, to answer Mr. Gates' question, you know, we should probably just have a 0% a budget increase. Well, I, I don't know that. You know, I have no idea if that's the right answer or the wrong answer. Um, what I do know is that as each week passes, we are going to understand more. We're going to know perhaps more about what programs are available for municipalities. Um, I sent out a document that shows that there are some, there's funding for schools, you know, related to this. Whether or not we're going to apply, be, have any, be able to apply for any of it, or it's going to be available to us, you know, who knows at this point, but with each passing week, we're going to be able to know more. Um, and so um, I am for, uh, despite my vote on March 23, I want to make it clear that I was a yes vote on March 23, uh, but despite that vote, I am in favor of delaying this process to the extent that it makes sense. Um, and I appreciate uh, my fellow counselors tonight saying, you know, we just got the budget and um, let's not call this the starting the clock. I, I definitely appreciate that. And I especially appreciate uh, Councilor, uh, I'm sorry, Chairman Johnson bringing in um, uh, Phil. Uh, I think uh, Phil is, he does a great job making things very clear, both in writing and in speaking. And I uh, greatly appreciate that. I think he really added to the conversation. So I'm sorry I, I spoke a little bit long here, but I appreciate the time. Thank you. Councilor Johnson? Councilor Johnson, your mic and your camera are off. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm um, technology challenged. <laughs> I, I look at this process uh, as a process that has to play out. I think this is a good starting point. We've got about 350 pages to read and digest and have conversations as the process moves forward. Uh, I think we understand our target uh, and hopefully we can drive under our target because time, times are tough and we're not sure what tomorrow holds. So. Let's get it done. Councillor Hayes. Yeah, good evening. And I think I'll kind of piggyback on what some others have said. Um, you know, I, I think where we are tonight and I will give, you know, I, I am a little bit concerned of some of the conversations that are already starting to take place in the community on social media. Um, you know, I, I think where the town manager and the superintendent delivered tonight, it, as Betsy had said, were, were goals that we had worked on jointly with the Board of Education throughout the summer and into the fall. In an ideal world, those were designed to deliver our th about a 3% budget increase, which is always, has always been our goal or tax rate increase. It's a different world today. And, and, and one of the, you know, there have been some surprises. One is sort of the reval and, and the $40 million reduction in assessed value that the town manager talked about. So I just want to be clear. I appreciate we have been working with the Board of Education. We've tried to work more with them over the years. Um, we had agreed on delivering at this point in time numbers that would have probably delivered close to a 3% increase, but they're just 
or some things beyond anybody's control. So before we have conversations about, you know, somehow them not delivering, we both the town manager and superintendent and the elected officials delivered what we expected. Now it comes the heavy lift. I did talk to Sarah Layton, who is the chair of the finance committee for the Board of Education. She's committed to, and she's, she's gonna work with, with her side of the house, if you will. We're committed, the joint finance committees will now come together and try to look at those numbers and figure out where we need to be. Um, in my humble opinion, I, I think we need to get much closer to the 3%. And, and frankly, I think we need to be under that 3% number, which is gonna be really tough. But I, it's been mentioned before, but I'm sure people have saw that the, the fallout from where we are is really just starting to ripple to the main economy. I, I don't know if people saw it, but Central Maine Medical Center just furloughed 300 employees today. Intermed furloughed a third of their staff. A while ago, the healthcare providers are really hurting. And when you look around our community, you know we have a huge main health complex here with a lot of people that are working. So as this comes through, I mean, I think every single one of us are sitting here and we probably know someone who has lost their incomes. I mean, I know a family within 48 hours that lost four incomes in the family. Um, I'm really concerned about this unique snapshot of time where funds are gonna will be running short. I don't know how long this is gonna go. I'm really concerned about, you know, I think Tom has shared that the tax collections, real estate tax collections for the second installment, which have occurred in March, we have, we're collected on. I'm really concerned about affordability and what happens in the September collection. So I think all of us really need to try to roll up our sleeves and say, how can we think about the taxpayers in our community and where they are? There's an awful lot of, you know, we have one of the oldest populations in Maine. Social Security went up 1%, and a lot of them rely on investments to, to make up the difference. And a lot of us have lost 30% of our investments with, with where the markets have gone. So I think all of us really, it's going to be a challenge. It's also an opportunity. We've been trying to build stronger relationships between the Board of Education and us. And I think this is a, a great time to see if we can come together and figure out what is the best thing to do for our community and how do we get there and how do we get there in a collaborative way without the divisiveness that, that has been sort of our pattern in the past. So I, I was encouraged that, that you know, the, the, the Joint Finance Committee seems to be willing to kind of sit down and, and at least roll up the sleeves and, and see where that takes us. So I think it's going to be a challenging process, but I, I think we need to be in a much different place than we are tonight. And I, I believe we'll get there in a positive way. Thanks, sir. Council, Councilor Hamill. I want to uh, also thank the superintendent and the town manager for their work and presentations this evening and the support of their respective staffs. I know lots going on in everyone's lives, you know, and our elected representatives on both, both uh, sides of uh, the town and school. Uh, special thanks to the public also for providing their input, uh, not only over social media, but through emails and calls and participating uh, in this, this virtual meeting this evening. Uh, and a special thanks to my fellow counselors in the chair. We've got a kind of a, a rumbly couple of days leading up to this meeting and uh, you know, really appreciate the open-mindedness uh, and energy of the chair and the, and the town manager to help us address key questions and provide clarity about what flexibility we might have in terms of uh, requirements and timing for the budget process. I think we should take advantage of whatever additional timing there may be. It's clearly clear these are unprecedented times. They're presenting us with more challenges than ever before in our personal, professional, and public service lives. But I'm hopeful, but I'm also optimistic that we can all rise to meet the challenges. We've, we've done good work together in the past. I know, I think the joint uh, finance committee work that was done was a great starting point. We know we need to do more. Uh, I'm committed as a counselor to, to that going forward. Uh, we're at a point in our, in our community, however, where we will be forced to make tougher choices and make more difficult decisions than we ever have. So one thing is brutally clear, the old ways of doing things will not solve the problems caused by the current health and economic crisis. So I support uh, some of the suggestions for us to reframe and, and very likely reset the targets as we move through the process and be more realistic and aggressive in terms of getting 
a cost structure in line that is going to be uh, acceptable uh, for people in, in the community. It may also be a time for us to look uh, to refocus away from prop relying on property appreciation, growth and development as the primary drivers for our town economy and our revenue sources. So doing anything less at this point would be a disservice to those who have suffered loss of life, health and economic security in the past several weeks in May and the weeks to come. We cannot continue to act like it is business as usual. We all need to accept some level of shared sacrifice in order to survive and prosper as a community. I think this includes young and old, rich and poor, those in public service and, and those on the private um, in private businesses as well. So each and every one of us uh, individually together. So I look forward to that work uh, ahead of us with you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I guess, first of all, well said by everybody. Um, personally, I can, I can tell from my conversations, there is a genuine in deep appreciation from every elected official on the current situation. Um, every staff member I've had an interaction with, every BOE member, every town councilor. Um, I think we are united in understanding the gravity of the situation and I'm looking forward to working with everybody. And I, I feel like from members of the public to the seven of us, to the seven BOE members, to all the staff, I feel like that we're all in the same place. We're ready to roll up our sleeves, get to work. There are going to be some tough decisions, but we're going to make them together, hopefully. So um, that's it. And again, I, my fellow counselors, very well said. So. Mr. Chair? Yes. May I, uh, can I just add one thing that I, I meant to, to mention? I've been making phone calls as part of that helping group that we've got going with uh, um, the town employees. Yeah. And um, I have about, I don't know, 20 people on my phone calls. I just want to thank the people of the town of Scarborough who have been so helpful to their neighbors because without exception, every elder that I, to whom I've spoken has spoken well about how their neighbors have reached out, have been helpful, have called and dropped off groceries and just done a number of things. So I want to thank the uh, people of Scarborough for your big heart. Um, it, means, it means the world to me. Um, and it really means the world to those those folks who are are um, not able to get out of their houses. So thank you. Okay. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. A second. Second. Thank you, Tody. Would you like to call it? Yes. Councilor Cucci. Yes. Councilor Hayes. Yes. Councilor Gleistein. Yes. Councilor Katarina. Yes. Councilor Johnson. Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.